We're back here at Capclave 2009 with Sheila Williams. Sheila, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And thank you for taking time out of being a guest of honor, which means you're heavily scheduled to stop by and talk with us. Uh, you have a unique story to tell because you, based upon your career history, have had an absolutely laser-like focus on moving to the current position you occupy, uh, starting at the bottom and working at almost every possible job at Isaac Asimov's magazine before you assumed the position of senior editor. Uh, and it all came about because of something, a story your father told you. Can you tell us about that? Well, when I was five, we lived in a, in a very rural community in western Massachusetts, and there, was, there were no bookstores and a very extremely tiny little library with the books were all hundreds of years old. And uh, so my father, a lot of my earliest reading or my memories of, of, of uh, storytelling is my father actually telling me stories. And so my father told me the story of a princess of Mars. And my father was a great storyteller. Years later, um, young men would come back and tell my father how much they remembered him telling ghost stories at Boy Scout events <laughs> and campfires. So he, he just captivated me with the, with the Princess of Mars. And then later he read me Tarzan of the Apes and The Gods of Mars, Warlord of Mars, and uh, much of Burroughs, and then Raphael Sabatini, and a lot of other wonderful adventure writers. And he read to me The Count of Monte Cristo. And oh. so he captured my interest in science fiction, which I think was extremely important because very statistically a lot of young of girls and young women do not get introduced to science fiction at an early age when it really I think needs to take mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so I'm very thankful for my father for doing that. You basically applied for a position and were hired at Asimov's when? Well I started to I started to try to get a job with the magazine in 1981, mm -hmm. and there was, at f or yeah, early, early, like January perhaps, and or February, and there was, they thought they were going to have a, a job opening on another magazine. So they said, well, get back to us in a four or five months. And I kept trying to getting back to them, and they kept saying another couple of months, another couple of months. And then they, uh, Shauna McCarthy said to me, you know, I don't think that job's going to come, it's going to happen. But there's a woman looking for a sub rights assistant and she needs someone with persistence and God knows you have <laughs> persistence. <laughs> so she, she said, may I have permission to pass your resume to her? And I said, sure. And so she did. She sent the resume over to Iris Temple who um, hired me as a subsidiary rights assistant. And mm -hmm. I worked with her for about six months, but then as soon as the editor of Asimov's, who was Kathleen Maloney, realized that she was going to have an opening, they knew I was there. They had they knew full well I was there. So they came to me and they said, the editorial assistant was going to be leaving. Would I like to have the job? So I was there, you know, ready for that job. And mm -hmm. I started on Asimov's uh, in late June of 1982. Three weeks after I had started as an editorial assistant, where I was very much an editorial assistant, typing letters for the editor. We had a slightly larger staff then, so you could have someone type your letters and uh, filing and all of that. Kathleen Maloney announced that she was leaving for to become the acquisitions editor at Time Mirror. Mm -hmm. Times Mirror. So Shauna McCarthy said to me, "Well, you're going to be the managing editor. We're not going to call you the managing editor. <laughs> you're not going to get a pay raise, but you're going to be you're going to have to take over all the duties of the managing editor because you know she was going to be the editor, and and we're not going to replace you." <laughs> so oh, you we're, lucky thing. Yes. Yeah, so we're not. We are. The staff is actually becoming one less person. Uh, so congratulations, you have a new job, but you have your old job too, so, and it's the same salary. So that was, but I was so excited about it. I, I really didn't, didn't mind at all because mm -hmm. it meant so much more interesting work. And Shauna said, well, I'm not going to have you type the rejection letters anymore. I don't have staff. I'm going to do all my own letters. And um, she took over certain duties that I would have had to do as an editorial assistant that mm -hmm. she felt as the editor she could do them quicker herself. So it made the job actually much more interesting. And so really, I only was really uh, that 
really excruciating grunt work of an editorial assistant for three weeks. <laughs> so that wasn't really so bad, as it turned out. And then you, you work with Isaac. Yes. And of course, you work with Gardner yes. forever, you know. And yes. I can't think of two more fascinating people to be associated with on a daily basis. Oh, very, very, lots of fun, definitely. I worked with Isaac for 10 years and with Gardner for 19 years. And uh, they were both really wonderful and great to work with. So you basically, along with Gardner and a few others, are really a touchstone for the recent history of short fiction in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, in the time that you have been at Asimov's, you've seen a number of different literary trends go left, right, and center. Uh, has that been reflected in the kind of short fiction that's been created for Asimov's? You will definitely find trends in the fiction. Um, when Shauna took over as editor, there was a, a turn away. There, there had been some wonderful stories published certainly before she was editor, but there was a turn more toward a type of literary fiction in Asimov's. Mm -hmm. And that had a lot of the material that was being published in Asimov's was literary, but had a very sort of, um, people called it humanist, but it was basically about the human condition. Well, then, of course, Bruce Sterling and Lou Shiner started to complain that science fiction was moving, was a little bit moving too much into the human condition and away from its roots of the science, staying up to date with the real t scientific revolution of, and also technological of the computer, advent of the computer, the so-called right. cyberpunk. So you saw an explosion of work in that direction as well, and of course we saw that in the short fiction that was coming into t to us as well. So, um, so again, we started seeing more stories that were on the cutting edge of technology and right. science, but usually incorporating that humanist element as well, still involved with the human condition. Um, over the years, what is the cutting edge of science changes, and mm -hmm. that changes sometimes what the, um, the trends are. Right. Also, I think, um, but again, now I think it's been straying away from the cutting edge of science and going now more into going maybe toward the, well, sort of some of the fantasy and, and, um, and again, literary styles. So we may need another Bruce Sterling to come along <laughs> and get put people or, back into shape. Or just have him come back. Right, right, in a whole new mode, but yes. I wanted to talk about this because I think for most people, the word editor is used, and everybody has this very vague idea of what an editor does. Let's talk specifically about Asimov's. As an editor, what is your day or month like in building an issue of the magazine? What do you do? Well, of course, a big part of my job, but unfortunately not nearly as big as most um, writers think is I have to find the material. Mm -hmm. And so I put um, several days into, you know, maybe four to eight days a month into reading material for the magazine. And I try, I read mostly everything that comes in, or I look at it, and I look at everything. One of my jobs is to look through the huge stacks of material from unknown authors, be, or, or authors who aren't known that well, because I constantly find new people, and I have to find new people because I constantly lose my authors that's to the, other that's ventures. That's the infamous slush pile that yes, everyone the, talks about? Yes, the slush pile, which is not a term I invented, is for the, it's, it's called for the unsolicited manuscripts, but everything we get is unsolicited because mm -hmm. we are not a magazine. You do not need an agent to send in your material to Asimov's. And a good thing for a writer to know. Yes, absolutely. There's, in fact, most agents, legitimate agents, there are very few. There are a couple who like to handle it, but most agents don't even want to handle short fiction. It's just they'd rather the authors took care of short fiction themselves. Mm -hmm. So I have to um, read through the material and and many stories that I'm going to buy just jump out, they're perfect, but there are stories that need to be re revised, edited, and so I work with the authors for some changes. And um, so that takes up probably 
25 percent of my time right. but I also have to uh, I write the editorials I write mm -hmm. all the introductory notes I do a certain amount of production work on the magazine I actually go over every page in the magazine I position material in the magazine I used the art department used to do more of that but they um, they and they used to tell me I didn't know how to do it but then they decided <laughs> that I they decided to have a smaller staff and they decided really I was an expert after all and so and I so I very lovingly go through every page and make every page oh. look the way I want it to and um, I have to make sure my columnists are coming in on time and I solicit things I've uh, recently commissioned um, non-fiction piece it just came out from Mary Robinette Koal about mm -hmm. um, you know a non-fiction article on science and I have so every so often I do I have to work on the we call them thought experiments and I have to prepare advertising leads for the advertising <laughs> department I prepare the web information for the person who puts up the website I um, you know I'm gonna leave out but I oh I, I work with the art department to, to lay out the poems and uh, they do the layout but I tell them how much space they have what they have to use so what you're saying is when you moved from typing the rejection notices and got picked up a job and took everything but the typing with you that was just the beginning of an accretion of a myriad series of responsibilities. Oh, yes, definitely. And most of the time, all it meant was a change in title? Oh, a lot of the time. <laughs> well, with the change of the title would come a raise. I mean, because that was actually turned out to my advantage that Shauna didn't change my raise, give me the title change then, because then she was able to work out um, some decent raises with mm -hmm. the titles. But I would constantly... I've constantly throughout my career taken on more and more responsibilities and it was wonderful because we in addition to editing the magazine I've edited 25 anthologies all through the magazine right. I've often written the uh, coming attractions box not under not while well, Gardner was at the magazine but all the time that Shauna was there right. and and then while Gardner was at the magazine I wrote all the reports on um, many reports that we did on say the Asimov Award that's now called the Dell Magazine Award for young for new writers right. and um, and I was in charge of judging that contest though Gardner and I would judge it together along with Rick Wilbur my co-founder and we um, the the great thing about this job has always been that there's so much room to grow and learn new things that I'm constantly ha coming up with new new um, responsibilities and now we're appearing in the uh, Kindle format and that's adding some work to my to my in terms of digitizing it so that it's trans I don't have to do any of that although uh, because we were already produced in electronic format until we're sent to the printer everything right. is there of course and then but now and the technical work that get makes us Kindle compatible is done completely off-site but there are questions of the layout of the magazine affects the the layout of how it appears on the Kindle is different. They go by the table of contents, so now I have to think of two things when I'm laying out. Oh joy! How it will appear here. I've learned the hard way that I have to do that versus how it will appear there, and to try to make the two come together so they're going to work well. And I, um, you know, so there so are, there's brand new things to think about, and it's exciting. I love it. It keeps me keeps me going. Let's go back to having to find new writers. What is the most, do you have a single writer that you discovered that you're particularly pleased that one, you found it, and two, that, uh, and th that they moved on? Is something, somebody that you really think was a diamond that you can claim discovery of? Well, I've had, it's a short, I have only been editor for five years, so right. some people have not, you know, I, I don't, haven't seen Big Blast, blockbuster novels necessarily from anyone but I'm very pleased I found um, Ted Kosmatka who was uh, completely unknown he'd had a play about mm -hmm. working in the steel industry and I published his first story and I published probably his first three stories before he was published in FNSF and I think the FNSF story was I think it made it well it, if it didn't end up at the Hugo ballot, it made it very close, you know, to some of these ballots. And, and I've got a new story coming out by him and Michael Poor that's just wonderful. And um, 
I, I, I know I didn't discover some people. There are people who were being published in the smaller presses, but mm -hmm. I have, I was perhaps their first major um, public, you know, publication in a, in a um, professional publication. Um, so there's an author, Sarah Gen Genji, mm -hmm. who is a, span a doctor in Madrid, and she's just wonderful also, a phenomenal writer. And um, there's uh, Matthew Johnson in Canada. He'd been published in On Spec, and, I, he, but, and he might have been published in Interzone, I'm not sure, but I definitely know I was the first major American publication to publish him. He's great, too, but uh, he has the, there's the other problem. He has a novel coming out. Authors have two things that take them away from writing. One is having a novel, and the other is a baby. So <laughs> <laughs> he, he had the baby problem recently. I mean, oh, it's dear. not a problem for him, but, you know, for me, it's, uh, so I've lost a few of them. Uh, um, but it's very exciting. When, uh, we're running short of time, so this will be the last question. No, no, oh. nobody wants to hear me. They want to hear you. Okay. Uh, what is it about a particular author or a particular story that makes it stand out and shine, as you said? From the rest, is there? Is there? It's not a formula. Is it just the way it makes you feel, the way that you flow through the story? What? <sighs> That's you know the million dollar question. Oh, yeah. There is something amazing. I, I was thinking there's a new author, Felicity Shoulders, who I just in the slush pile, no cover letter, started reading the story, and it just, it from the minute I started, I knew I, this is a great story. I just bought a new a new guy, a novella from someone I never heard of. No one's ever heard of. His name is Greg Bozart. And I look. He has no previous publications. It's there's something about the control in the first paragraph. You are not. If you were to start with someone waking up or eating breakfast, there would be a really good reason for it. But usually, in, there you're not. You're starting right in the middle of something very interesting. In Felicity's case, it was a mother trying to get her son to childcare. But mm -hmm. it was still immediately brings you into a story that something's happening, that you want to find out what's going to happen next, you're worried a little bit about what might happen next, and it keeps that up, and then all the way through, and then the end is refreshing. They don't just sort of all die in a car accident or get eaten by a monster, though that could happen. <laughs> but there's, the, but if they did it, there's again, it's, it's, there's a satisfying conclusion to the story that you feel that you as the reader have really benefited from that experience. It's been really joyful and interesting. Even if it's a sad story, the experience of having read it is, a is something that is uplifting. And I think maybe the fact that I read so many stories sometimes helps me because I've read so many stories that when I hit that story, that really holds my attention. You see it. Yes. You see it. Well, you know, it sounds like despite the expansion of your duties, the long work week, the need to find continuing new authors, as a boss of mine used to ask us every once in a while on a particularly long week, are we having fun yet? And the answer for you is yes. Yes, very much. Oh, Sheila. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Well, it's thank been you. wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, it, for us, too. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schott saying, take care. <laughs>